Hello, everyone, and welcome to the next presentation in our Working Tools seminar series. My name is Andrew Martindale, and I am here, as always, on behalf of Allison Wiley and Eric Simons as organizers of this series, which is titled Community Facing Data Management Platforms for Indigenous University Partnerships. And I want to begin by acknowledging that UBC Vancouver is located on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. The land it is situated on has always been a place of learning for the Musqueam, who for millennia have passed on their culture, history, and traditions from one generation to the next in this territory. Um, and as an aside, and building out of that theme, this seminar was inspired by a summer series hosted by our colleagues at Musqueam, and we were fortunate to be able to build on their model and their momentum. And we've had a lot of interest from presenters and participants this, uh, this time around about carrying this effort forward with, a, with another series in the new year. Uh, and Aviva and Cody and I have been chatting about developing just such an initiative, somehow organized or co-organized rather by Musqueam and UBC. And we're still in the planning stages, but I hope that I'll have more information for you about this next step in the coming weeks. I'd also like to acknowledge and support the, the support, pardon me, of the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada and UBC's Green College for helping us organize this series. Just gonna admit the people in the waiting room. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm multitasking. I'm not very good at multitasking. Uh, a little bit of housekeeping, keep your microphones and video feeds turned off. If you can, I don't think we're gonna have a, too much of a, of, a, of a bandwidth issue today, but uh, uh, you can, uh, so you can turn yours on or off as you see fit. If you do have a question or a comment during the presentation, please add it to the chat or let us know that you'd like to ask something. Eric is away today. Allison is going to be joining me, I hope, but if not, you can just send me a note and I'll compile the list for questions for Peter after the discussion, or pardon me, for the presentation after, uh, for the discussion after the presentation. If you've missed any of our previous talks, the recordings of these are available on our website. So it's a great pleasure to welcome our next presenter. Uh, Peter Evans is the co-founder and the CEO of Trailmark Systems and Consulting, the creators of the Trailmark software system for the collecting, recording, archiving, analysis, and management of landscape-based knowledge. Peter is a cultural geographer and an anthropologist with graduate degrees from the Scott Polar Institute Research Institute of the University of Cambridge. Peter also has a history in journalism and was the editor of the Inuktitut English magazine. And you're gonna to have to please forgive me for my pronunciation. Here we go. Kina Tuinamut Iligadjuk. That was really I, good. I hope, oh, thank you. I hope I, I, hope I didn't mispronounce that and, and I, in, in, in too badly. Uh, uh, today, Peter is going to discuss the challenges of Indigenous communities, uh, pardon me, that Indigenous communities face in managing knowledge in the context of colonial encroachment on their territories, while providing us with insight into the history and the design of the Trailmark system. His talk is titled Social Enterprise Approaches and Cloud SAAS Software for CRM, or How I Spent All My Money Building Software. Please well, join me in welcoming Dr. Peter Evans. Peter. Well, thank you very much, Andrew. I don't know. I'm not just flattering you, but did you know that you have a really nice broadcast quality voice? Is that anything you did in the past? Or I uh, know I. Yeah. Uh, it's good to know I have a backup plan. Should this gig kind like of minute. kind of falter on me? <laughs> yeah. Well, thank thank you very much for having uh, for having me here and for organizing these these seminars. Um, uh, I always really admired Green College. I had uh, I had an opportunity to attend a couple of events there many years ago. I think it's a great. Um, a great system that they've set up there. It feels like a, a wonderful um, community that they've established there, uh, community of the mind. So uh, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I am going to uh, start my um, little slideshow here. I don't really have much um, um, housekeeping or anything like that. Just uh, thank you for uh, attending. I'm gonna talk for a while, um, but please, um, if anybody has a question that they'd like to um raise while i'm talking don't don't be shy to interrupt me i'm not tied to anything i have to say um it's all opinion so um yeah so my name is um my name is peter evans uh, i am one of the founders of um of trailmark systems um i see a couple of my my colleagues are on the are on the phone as well um i i am a, a human geographer and anthropologist and I've been working with Indigenous communities across Canada for about, uh, I think I started in 1996. So uh, that's more than 20 years, right? That's, um, it's just over, it's 20 something years. Um, 
And uh, I started out as a, as a journalist in northern in northern Labrador in the place that's now called uh, called Nunatsiavut, in a little community called Nain. And um, I went there to work uh, to cover the Voices Bay nickel mine. Um, uh, my my role was to uh, to help translate. Um, science into a um, into a uh, a language and a discourse that could be um, um, better understood in the community there. And I was teamed up with uh, an older man named William Cullio, and um, William Cullio became um, a lifelong friend of mine. Before he passed away, we had many uh, many great uh, adventures together, um, where we attempted to understand one another and to communicate across our mutual uh, divides. Uh, and that was actually sort of where I fell um, in love with the notion of communicating across, across divides, disciplinary divides, uh, cultural divides. Um, William and I had a little office in a, a small building that, out, that looked out over Unity Bay in Nain. And uh, the building had at one time it had been built by uh, by an Arctic explorer from from Maine, um, and it had then been taken over by the Moravian Mission in the 1920s, and it had been run as their um, as their residential school. And we had a little office upstairs, and the office was was stuffed full of materials, archival materials, um, radio materials, um, uh, and in that in 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 that room. Um, I found a copy of Helgi Cliven's book, The Eskimos of Northeast Labrador. Uh, and that was actually my introduction to, um, to uh, interdisciplinary uh, geography and anthropology. And uh, I really loved Helgi Cliven's approach, Cliven's approach to um, uh, historical um, ethnography. And uh, so afterwards, I decided to go back to, uh, to grad school and become, I don't know, an anthropologist or something. Um, or maybe a geographer, but really what I wanted to do was just to continue to work um, with hunters and with, um, uh, with people who had um, uh, knowledge that I didn't have. Um, a couple of years later, I met uh, a couple of uh, people who are very close friends and partners of mine now, uh, York Toos, uh, who was a software developer, and Beth Keats. And uh, we got together with some other colleagues and we started this software company um, uh, initially to work with, uh, with some friends at the Nunavut Wildlife Management Board. Um, the Nunavut Wildlife Management Board had a, had a data collection uh, and methods problem that uh, they wanted a new, new approach to. Um, they, wanted to. they wanted to do better at recognizing the unique expertise that hunters have to gather and record their own knowledge and to operationalize it in their own terms. Um, so rather than doing a sort of conventional um, participatory harvest survey, they wanted to, uh, to empower hunters with technology to do their own um, uh, inscription of that knowledge. So uh, Jorg and Beth and, and myself and some other colleagues, we founded Trailmark initially to do that, that work of creating a mobile approach to field data collection for hunters. Um, we worked very closely with uh, with another colleague in Nova Scotia whose name was Rebecca Jepson. Um, she works with a company called Nova Silla, and she's been really uh, instrumental in, in in promoting that work across across Nunavut. Um, that program is still it was cutting edge when it first began, but it's still running in Nunavut today, um, and that that helped us get a new perspective on on working with hunters and working with hunting communities to create rich data up to that point my entire approach had been my entire understanding of this kind of work had been participatory gis and oral history interviews um, and uh, i was i was kind of unaware of this of the the possibilities that that, are, that are a method like this or a methodology like this could open up um, so that was kind of the beginning of trailmark but it didn't really do anything at first to address um, the other regions of knowledge, um, qualitative data, story, experience, memory. Um, and there was a, uh, an elder here in uh, Saanich, which is a place that's very, it's very dear to me, 
uh, its home and uh, named Eric Pelkey, who called uh, Beth and I together at once and said, I'd like you to build a database for us so that we can access all our traditional knowledge when we need it. So whether it's for our engagements with the Crown or for our consultation with the Crown or our discussions with DFO, or um, we have all this material on hand and we also have it in our minds, but we need to be able to deploy it in a way that the state can deploy it. Um, so that was sort of bringing the other aspect of, of, of uh, research together so that we could have a, we could work at a more um, holistic kind of knowledge ecosystem. And that was the idea of Trailmark. So um, I'm going to start a little slideshow for you here. Can you guys see my screen okay? Someone give me the thumbs up. Yep, we're good. Yeah. We can see. Thank you. Yeah. So Trailmark is a is a software and a um, uh, a consulting company. We do uh, lots of um, research as well. We do we're involved in all kinds of different um, crazy research projects across Canada. Uh, I myself do a lot of um, lately a lot of specific claims work and um, environmental assessment work, community based monitoring. Um, uh, I support negotiations. Um, my, some of my colleagues do regulatory analysis, uh, others do graphic facilitation. Actually, my colleague, Anna might be, might be, she might be on this call sketching the whole thing out. I'm not sure right now, but she might, she might be out there drawing this entire conversation. She, she will often just surprise you with a drawing after you've spoken to her. So, um, uh, so yeah, we do that. We do that kind of work. Um, so Trailmark is an indigenous knowledge software. It's, an, it's intended to be a platform to, uh, to bring different types of knowledge together. Um, it's a knowledge management plat platform specifically designed for indigenous communities. And it organizes a community's existing knowledge and information. And it creates, attempts to create links between different materials, uh, maps, stories, recordings, and archival um, entities. Um, and then it combines that, um, that existing data with built-in tools for conducting new research and analysis. Um, the thing that probably all of you will know is that when you work for any kind of small community, it can be over overwhelming how many research projects are on the go at one time. I was actually on a call this morning with a community that had 60 different research projects on the go out at, at one time. Um, so Trailmark is being used uh, by our community partners and clients for land use and occupancy research, traditional knowledge research, ethnographic research, digital archive management, environmental monitoring, community land use planning, uh, customary tenure mapping, uh, harvest studies, public participation research, citizen science projects, um, archaeological research. It's being used for a lot of different uh, stuff. It's a software as a service that's sometimes shortened into SaaS. Um, SaaS uh, softwares are always cloud-based, um, but other than that, they have a bunch of different attri um, attributes. They uh, they're cloud-based, so they tend to be they run on the internet and they can be accessed anywhere on the internet. But you do need an internet connection for them. Um, one of their um, sort of key features is that you intend them to be easy to use um, because you're able to constantly tool them and modify them according to the data that you're that you're getting on the fly from users. Um, and because they're cloud hosted, it's easy to issue new updates or to, to put out bugs. So that allows you to, to develop the thing very quickly. Uh, with Trailmark, we, we, we release new features on a monthly basis. Um, and we're, you know, if a bug arises, we, we usually put it out in the, within a couple hours or the, or the same day. And then much larger releases we're doing probably every two or two or three months. I can't remember which version we're on now, but the software is completely different today than it was when we launched it in 20, in 2014. Um, so that's kind of a feature of SaaS softwares is that unlike something that you, that you buy and you run on your, on your server. Um, because it's harder, you know, it's harder for the for the, the software provider to uh, to work on that, and the the training for those kinds of softwares are is is often um, 
um, uh, there's a there's a much steeper training curve. Um, whereas with SaaS, you can with the SaaS software, you can deliver the entire kind of training program alongside the software. One of the reasons that I wanted to we all wanted to do SaaS to uh, SaaS a SaaS product to deal specifically with the some of the knowledge um, deployment issues that we were seeing in communities um, was because one thing that I would see over and over again was what was was uh, deep investments in in really um, complex GIS training um, that would and 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 investments in in GIS software and 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 um, geo geo databases and servers and um, uh, and expensive printers that would depend on one person who'd received a lot of training and then they would maybe move on to another another job so you'd, you'd get this situation where you might have like five or six different versions of of ArcGIS in a single office and they would be out of the the license would have expired on each one and the person who had learned it had 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 moved on to something else some downsides is that SaaS softwares are not easily customized because there is essentially one software that's running in the cloud and then it's instantiated. So there might be, there's 60 different clients, but it ultimately is one software at the back, at the back end. We don't like to do customizations. We like to do, we like to do, um, uh, we like to add new functionality to the software that everybody can use. So we have a kind of internal process, which is pretty loose. If a client has a has a request for us, something they'd really like to see in the software, we'll look at it and say, is this something that everybody could use? Or can we take this request and respond to it or build it in a certain way that it would be flexible enough for everybody to use? Um, and if the answer is yes, then we'll add it into our own into our own development plan. Um, but if it's if it's no, we'll usually have to have to say, I'm sorry, we can't we can't accommodate that within the within the 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 horizon of the software right now. Um, and the other, of course, one of the other things with web-based softwares is that they're intended to be interoperable with other web platforms through um, automatic programming interfaces or APIs. Uh, we own the software. We're completely responsible for it. And we also own the IP of the software. But we, we try to make a very clear line between what is ours and what is our, what is our clients? Um, everything that's inside the software belongs completely to their to our clients, and the software um, belongs to us in the true sense of the word. It is the responsibility for maintaining it um, and for maintaining the security of the data is entirely on us, and we act as a trusted party. Um, everything about what we do is based on trust. Um, it's based on on having our our clients. Uh, chief and counsel and uh, the hunters um, and the elders uh, get to know us and to trust that this incredibly precious data of theirs, which is um, the foundation not only of their, you know, their own personal household use and food security, but also of their of their rights and title, um, would be would be um, safe in our hands and that we can be trusted with all the many um, confidences that that implies. The other thing about SaaS products is that you get a lot of data because they're running in the cloud. So, um, you know, we know, for instance, how you know how many how many how many clients we have, and this this data is actually a little, couple of years old now. It's gone up, but you know, we we know how many user accounts there are, and how many projects are running, and we can look and see who's who's logged in and at any one time, and more importantly, for the development of the software, we get a sense of, of how often it's being used. So I just pulled out a little bit of data there to see that, um, you know, there's three communities at the top there that have, oh, I'm not wearing my glasses, uh, 6,900 unique logins. So um, we want, there's no, we, there was no point for any of us to do this unless the staff at lands departments and heritage departments and chief and counsel or whoever, whoever needs to have that knowledge inform their decision making are actually going to use the software. So this is, this is, the, this is the indicator that we monitor the closest. 
And if I see like a usage drop off for the client, I'll possibly reach, usually reach out to them and say, Hey, is everything, is everything okay? Do you, um, have you got some new staff or something? And often, often that's the case, or maybe they're just in a, in a lull with projects that they're working on. Um, but you can kind of tell by that law, by the, by that, um, metric, how successful we are at, at, um, building a platform that people can use and, um, and that, that helps them, um, uh, protect their, their rights to title. Um, so this is the one that's, that we, that we are, uh, most concerned about. And it's also the one that we're, that we're most proud of, proud about, proud of, proud about, <laughs> proud of, um, yeah. So just some screenshots of things that people do in Trailmark. These are all prog programs that I've been involved in training, you know, training. These are some of the things that I talked about earlier, um, land use and, uh, community-based monitoring and, um, mobile field data collection and, um, um, field surveys and that type of thing. If you go across the top there, you can see, uh, Trailmark ingests conventional GIS and there's different kinds of analytics that you can get from inside the platform. Um, that's a picture of some young people at Beecher Bay that I trained in, um, in GIS and later in, um, um, uh, community-based monitoring for a, uh, for a dive program that they have. Uh, that's a little bit of arc field work that a friend of mine was doing on the, on the right. This one down here is a really cool project that, um, young guy I know, uh, did he, he wanted to improve, um, the delivery of services, um, at his, uh, community. Um, Telus was unable to, was having difficulty finding house locations. Um, so he just went out and, and ground truth, uh, people's addresses and shared it with CRD and with Telus and other service providers. Typical kind of thing that happens with, uh, Trailmark is, um, um, you know, as a, as a social scientist, um, I, when I go to work with a community, I, I always need access to that, um, to that really rich and thick description that's contained in the, the memories and, uh, the, the knowledge of ancestors and elders and in research that's been done in the past, or even in, in, in ethnographies, that's, um, uh, that's often contained in, in archives that, that, um, uh, indigenous communities have not had the resources to, to manage in the same way that the state has. So they're always at a disadvantage when they have to go engage in, in, um, in, um, uh, to negotiate some kind of, uh, um, anything to do with their, with their rights and title, um, or, or environmental, um, management, because getting access to that archive is so difficult and being able to deploy it. So, you know, that, that's a real archive that I helped to organize it. And I see, have seen things like this, um, um, all across Canada. Uh, the thing is in, in that image, there's probably a million dollars worth of of research in the past. And there's also an invaluable source of knowledge about, about the past to help guide the future. Um, so before you can kind of move on to those, uh, you know, sophisticated modern monitoring programs, um, uh, you know, in many projects that our, our clients do, they'll involve some kind of, you know, large scale digitization of that existing knowledge base that's in their community. And that will involve digitization of old materials, the um, the digitization of of participatory map projects, where you're where you're connecting um, uh, the materials of of um, of um, past um, traditional use mapping or traditional knowledge mapping, whether they be transcripts and paper maps and um, and audio uh, collections together, so that they can be um, they can exist inside the platform in a more integrated way. And then that, and then that kind of rich material becomes the basis or the baseline against which new monitoring can be done. So, um, I talked about, I talked about communicating with my friend, William Cullio over, over the, um, fault lines between us, uh, as a younger person. And then, um, and how intrinsic that that ongoing conversation is to, to be able to uh, um, 
to achieve reconciliation or 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 success in any kind of any any kind of um, uh, project. I think at at Trailmark as a company and also in the in the work we do, there's a constant ongoing conversation between different disciplines. Um, even though it's a it's a company, it sometimes feels more like um a university there's a really high level of, of discourse between us all um both between you know us as as um as uh as um as as workers but also uh with with our with our clients as well um and i think there's a number of of uh kind of fault lines and divides that we're we're always we're always um talking over and looking to bridge and that's not only the the fault lines between traditional knowledge and science, which is the one that that um, you know we 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 aim to uh, to assist with, but it's fundamentally between the the quantitative natural sciences and the more qualitative research methods of the social sciences, um, because that's really the place where where that that the fault line between traditional knowledge and science um, um, is is maintained. Um, so we find that this is a this is not only a conversation that happens in our work, but it's also one of the things that the platform is is designed to facilitate, and it's also the area that we we continue to to want to um, um, uh, expand its capabilities in. I think if you would ask me where where Trailmark will be in in a year or two, I would I would say capable of much more quantitative and GIS based analysis. And capable of of much greater qualitative analysis and much greater integration at the same at the same time. So, um, yeah, I think I'm just gonna like, what time? Are, how, is this an hour? Is it how long is this anyway? I'm just I should judge what I do next. Yeah, yeah an hour is great, and then you can uh, we have uh, another thirty minutes for questions. So yeah. Yeah. Okay. Before I actually do like a little software thing, does anybody have any questions now while I was talking about? Stats? Yeah, I just, uh, this is Allison Wiley. I just, I sent out a note to everyone to um, just send questions to me or to everyone through the chat function. Um, mostly I was gonna collect them for the end, for Q&A at the end, but if anybody has a question now, uh, great that you are willing to take them. Does anybody? Let me know or just turn on your audio and raise a question. I'm not seeing anything. Okay. Um, yeah, maybe you should just cool. forge ahead, but yeah, the, um, be thinking of questions. We'll have lots of time for them. That's good. I didn't actually want to take questions right now, but my 14 year old daughter has been calling me nonstop for the last like five minutes. I, it gave me an excuse to go find out what the problem was. So we're good, sad? we're all good. Do you, want, do you need more time or are you okay? No, we're good, I just solved it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> not a drama, not a major drama. Okay. Good. Yeah. Okay. I am going to stop my share here so I can, because I've never been able to do this. So, um, yeah. So, you, of course, you're all surrounded by SaaS, SaaS products and cloud based platforms. So, you're probably familiar with the kind of experience or user interface you get when you when you log in and it's no different with trailmark you log into a secure platform which is your own instance and then you have a bunch of functionality within it and it all runs in the cloud and usually uh, on that opening page you'll get um, resources for the user and those might be um, access to the help center or to training videos um, and and so there's there's lots of training material and such trailmark and also um, Quick links to things that you certain functions that are, are fairly fairly common and, and standard. Um, I should say that I got uh, permission from my from the lands director here at um, at SACOM to use their database today, so I could show you some actual things instead of the junk that I keep in my in my uh, demo account. Um, so there is a nice. Uh, um, uh, data plot, um, visualization tool inside Trailmark. So you can see, you can kind of monitor uh, your number of users and your data usage and the number of projects and how many records you have in it. There's also a button just like there is in Facebook uh, to download your entire database. 
So I don't know if you've ever left Facebook in a terrible huff um, after engaging in that, you know, <laughs> in a flame war with your mortal enemy and you, you're just, yeah. So we have the same, the same function as here. You can, you can bail if you like. Um, I usually, I usually advise our clients, even though we have rolling daily backups and we use the Amazon web uh, cloud in central Canada, I still think it's a really good idea just for your own um, da uh, data sovereignty and peace of mind to download your database on a, on a you know, six monthly or yearly basis or, or whatever. Uh, we also have here uh, something that I haven't really touched on yet, but the other thing that we wanted to, 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 to build as part of this, the platform vision is that because, um, because you can do so much with, with cloud-based platforms and, um, uh, and the interoperability of them, um, we also wanted to create, to create a platform that people could share resources um, on as well. So both that they could easily share data with one another between communities, um, between um, communities of practice and, and agencies, between Trailmark and our, and our clients. Um, that could uh, include uh, any kind of data that's inside the system, whether it's interview data or GIS data or um, archival collections, um, so that you could just basically click here on a survey choose the survey data you want to uh, share and then enter the recipient account and the email and set an expiration date. And all of that data would show up in the person's, uh, in the other, in the other account, in the other, the other um, platform, or the other instance. Um, and in addition to the data itself, because there is so much similarity from nation to nation um, uh, in the, in the kinds of projects and the kinds of challenges that First Nations face dealing with the crown or, or companies and managing natural resources um, or protecting their rights and rights and title. We also wanted to be able to share resources like 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 forms. So uh, this is a new a new feature we've added. So if someone builds a uh, say an, uh, you know it's a lot of work to build a form, right? Like let's say the the BC the the um, the site assessment form um, uh, is really annoying to make into a mobile field app. So let's say it takes you like a day and how many, you know, let's say, let's say there's 20 other First Nations who also need the same app. Well, that's 20 days of productivity and then uh, all the field testing. So what, what you can do is you can hopefully, you know, um, as, as this feature picks up, picks up um, uh, speed and popularity, you'll be able to go into the form library and download this, um, the, the form that someone else has made, uh, someone in another community. Um, so this is a, a, a way of sharing cross-platform. So the um, Trailmark has a fairly sophisticated access and permission system, which allows, uh, which allows the, the database to be subdivided into communities and then uh, to have um, uh, community admins and a main client admin appointed. There's a, a couple of differences in permissions that you can restrict access between community administrators and client administrators. And then there's, uh, there's additional four other layers of access and permission below that with the lowest being proponent. Um, so uh, a proponent um, with access to the system, for instance, could log in and post a uh, a referral under the Heritage Act or under the um, Forest Management Act, and all they would see is their form to post that referral. They wouldn't have access to any other data. The highest level of permission is the client administrator, and the client administrator can can do anything: uh, add data, delete data, um, etc. And you can split the database into separate communities. Um, uh, a lot. I was just about to say indefinitely, but I don't. I don't know if that's true, so I won't. I won't say that. I think it could. Uh, those communities could be uh, communities of, of, of practice, like um, could be uh, forestry versus lands inside an administration, or it could be. Um, it could be communities to reflect um, uh, intellectual property within a community. So you could split the database by say houses, um, or by uh, by families as well. There's a, uh, 
there's a system of or a typology of of um, uh, map codes and categories that are applied to um, the sort of qualitative based um, map data that is ingested inside the platform. Um, most of this data is the kind of data that comes from traditional land use or knowledge studies um, or from uh, participatory mapping. It tends to be map data that's linked to um, uh, larger mat material sets like transcripts, audio, or that comes from um, uh, observer input um, or is made by sort of um, um, free text input. Uh, it's usually connected to materials like that. We, we so the, um, the typology is fairly flat. It consists of both categories uh, and codes. Um, you can make generate as many categories as, and codes as you want. You can move categories around and change their names uh, without any consequence to the to the data. Um, there are some consequences for changing the map codes because those map codes link materials together. So. Um, the map codes are what links the transcript to the audio file and in turn to the map. Each code for that kind of qualitative data is a unique code in the database. Um, we, the reason that we put this in is, all, is, is because A, there, there is this actual problem of linking discrete materials together that come from a, a, a single interview event, say. Um, but also because a lot of the data that communities have to ingest um, into their databases or that they have to work with for their, for their consultation or, or uh, negotiation or regulatory um, uh, engagement is, it has a system of codes in it already. <laughs> and, uh, and those codes sometimes go back to Mr. Boaz himself. And they may, they, there's a great, um, uh, What's the word I'm looking for? There's a, there's a lot of variance in those systems of code. Some of them are very complex. Some of them are really hierarchical. Some of them have numbers. Some have like squiggly lines. Some have uh, uh, lots of decimals in them. They're just all over the place. And if you don't come up with some simple approach to synthesizing all of this, it can be just a, a monstrous headache. So this is our uh, approach. It's very uh, easy to... Um, to generate uh, categories and codes and to create to create new ones, you would just say create a code and then uh, nest it, uh, give it a code description and then nest it under uh, a category. Um, the point of all that is, is that it allows you to see into everything at once so that, remember, remember in the data I showed you where it's that there were currently about six, it's probably closer to 700 projects across all our clients right now. If you're a First Nation and you've got a hundred different um, research projects that have been conducted over the 15 years, you will want to see all of your traditional knowledge data that's about bears at once without having to go into a hundred different discrete projects and aggregate that data together. You will want to be able to access it um, quickly. Um, so that's the, that's the point of that, of that coding system. So very similar to a qualitative um, coding system that you would use in, uh, for, um, for textual analysis. So the Tromark ingests uh, GIS data in two different ways. It ingests, ingests sort of conventional GIS data as map layers. Um, and then it also takes in the, the data that comes from these, these more qualitative approaches uh, in a slightly more dynamic way where you can link transcript and audio and um, map code together. Um, so there's a specific kind of function inside the software for doing, um, for doing those, that kind of uh, work. I'm just going to make a little test here. I, I breezed by a button there called license. That is a, um, um, a function for creating um, custom traditional knowledge licenses that you can attach to to uh, to map data. So you can see here, this is the main um, 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 uh, widget for creating maps. You can see here you've got your your basic metadata about the about the about the project. There's a space here for transcripts. The transcript has a function in it for creating map code snippets. 
Uh, that's essentially you upload the transcript and then you associate um, the uh, map code that comes from uh, from the from the geometry with the section in the transcript, um, and then that trans that piece of the transcript will go along with that geometry when it's exported, uh, and adding uh, adding geometries to the. Let me see here. So if I go ID code here and I type in H, uh, the database tells me what the next integer for that code is. So it's H five. I'm just going to go test you for attributes for this kind of data. You've got keywords and then a, a main description field. Now with that geometry that's there now, I can also add in whatever layers I've got to the base map there too. Comes up here, you get your attributes here on the right hand side. You can see there's the, uh, this is a KML file. Um, you've got the keyword, uh, the main attribute. Now I've got other functions over here on the right. I can associate this with a, um, with a time period, a custom time period. I can uh, add photos to that geometry. Um, I can add it to a public page. I can tag it with an archive file. So let's say there's something in the archive that I want to tag with that geometry. Um, I can also um, manage an audio snippet with it. So you can upload an audio file and then identify if there's a piece of audio that you want to associate with that, with that geometry. Uh, so if you had say, if you wanted to make say a place names map, you would have, you would hopefully have one audio file of, of someone reading, of someone speaking place place names, and then you would import the place names file and just assign the specific um, audio um, uh, time 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 code to that to that geometry. And then there's discrete sections down here in the in the uh, in the widget for whatever supporting documents go along with the. Um, Go along with the uh, with the map that you're building. You can also add add in um, GIS layers to the base map there as well. So one of the things that one of the functions that Trillmark is is very popular for is uh, mobile field data collection. So Trillmark has a um, a uh, custom app builder um, and integrated analytical tools for. For both, for both uh, generating apps for, for field data collection and then for uh, syncing the data and being able to run um, um, uh, analysis on the results, um, including the thematic analysis, but also GIS analysis as well. Um, it's a nice little um, um, form builder. Uh, the app is, let me see. Looks like this, this is like a, this isn't a very good image that I'm doing right here. It's not a very good, not a good selling job. It looks like this. Um, the app is about, this particular app is, uh, is about four years old now. We're actually just, um, we have uh, our mobile developers working on the next iteration of Trillmark Mobile, which I think will be out probably in the early, in the early new year. Um, so it works, it works completely offline. You download, you download um, map, uh, map tiles that you cache on your phone, and you can also add in whatever uh, spatial data you want to your to your phone. So let's say if your workflow was, I have traditional knowledge, I have some traditional land use results in my database, you would put those onto your phone as a map layer, uh, add in a form for ground truthing. Um, your staff would go out to the field, do some data collection, come back, sync it, and then you would have both sets of uh, results inside your uh, database. And there's kind of some uh, some built-in analytical tools uh, for the data that comes back from the field as well. Um, there is a whole archival component to Trailmark that's just for the collection of um, the collection and, and archivization of of existing materials. So materials from uh, paper records from your office or from the archive. Um, uh, there's a there's a function for batch upload of uh, of data, um, and it ingests data of different different kinds into the archive, which you then uh, curate as part of uh, collections. Uh, you can post these collections to a public page. You can share collections with other other communities, and you can also assign uh, custom licenses to those to those collections as well. And you can also assign time periods. 
So you have basic the basic kind of um, uh, most of the category, most of the um, Dublin Core. Um, uh, what do you call them headers here? And I thank Amber Reddington, who might be on this call for uh, first alerting us to the importance of this because it was a little bit outside my my field. Um, and then we also built uh, some custom fields uh, for when people are doing things like oral history projects where they need some other some other headings um, uh, for that. So originally this was uh, a functionality that was specifically for um, small archives, but since we've added the the batch upload function. Um, some communities are starting to build very large, uh, very large archives. Actually, this community here, Sakem, um, you know, there's there's several hundred um, um, uh, items in their archive now. But actually, we were working on a back up, batch upload of several thousand, um, and it was materials from from museums and materials from archives, which essentially uh, the the archive feature helps to kind of steal back. So. Uh, uh, which I like. Um, yes, so that's archive. Um, there's also a survey function here. 349, really? Oh, that's late. Okay. Um, a lot of our uh, a lot of our clients who, who are looking at a kind of mixed method approach to uh, harvest studies or to traditional knowledge research. Find the um, uh, the the survey function inside Trailmark is particularly useful because it has a um, uh, uh, spatial input. So not only are you you know can you ask sort of more semi structured questions or or, or structured questions or semi structured questions where people are inputting free text answers, but you can also add um, uh, you can also add spatial spatial uh, questions to your survey with really flexible attributes. So you can essentially, um, uh, you know, you you can because you can define the attributes yourself. They don't necessarily have to match the rest of the data on the rest of the data model of the software. So you could ask people, you know, to describe their or to 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 choose their emotions in a particular landscape, um, uh, or whatever kind of other attributes you want to you want to you want to assign to those uh, geometries. I'll just do a little preview here. I'm not sure. Um, so this uh, the survey function is is used uh, is being used a lot in a lot of uh, harvest survey uh, harvest uh, survey projects. I can't see my own screen. There we go. So if I open up the map down here. And then, um, and then finally, there's a um, there's a referrals function as well, which is for the the uh, designing of referral forms to invite um, to control the workflow for how referrals are both posted to to a nation, and then how their how the deadlines are tracked and responded to, um, and uh, how the analysis on whatever whatever uh, uh, or sorry how the knowledge that's in your that's in your database can inform your response to those referrals. Uh, so there's a function for creating forms. Um, there's a there's a widget for um, there's a little function for let me see here. I'm gonna remember to go take this back. There's a function here for uh, building forms. These are forms that a proponent will uh, see on the um, front end when they log in, uh, and they would input spatial data as well. Um, and you can run after you know when you're receiving referrals, whether it's whether you're uploading them yourself or whether the proponent is doing it um, from a secure login or whether they're logging in through a portal. You can also run um, uh, data reports on the on the spatial inputs of those referrals after they. Uh, begin to come in um, and advance through a certain stage. You can set yourself the um, uh, the um, workflow that you want to follow. You can name the stages of that referral process. Uh, so you can see here, here's our response uh, 
So this is a this is the referral geometry, and then this tells you in the report what the um, contiguous geometries are, and it gives them to you by by uh, by type and by category. You can also export that data as a as a CSV, and you can also uh, manage the uh, deadlines of the of the referral and uh, export the calendar. And you can also just view uh, referral referral spatial data and deadlines by uh, by a special map as well. So I'm running out of time, so I want to just finish with search because search is a place where the different uh, data and, and methods kind of come together inside, inside Trillmark. We have a pretty powerful uh, search engine um, that uh, our developers have built, overseen by um, York Twos, who's our main uh, software engineer, and he's just a superlative tech guy. Um, he's been working in, in search and analytics for, for um, many years. He also has a PhD in systems ecology, which is what makes him so um, ideally suited to this kind of work. Um, so here you get here you get sort of your ability to um, to uh, to view sort of conventional um, GIS layers. Uh, and this is actually a little historical GIS project I was working on. Um, I have to say that the software that Andrew showed had some really cool functionality when it came to um, uh, importing this kind of data. There was kind of there's a couple of things that he did that he's doing with that software, which I still don't understand what he was doing. But I meant to ask him about it about it afterwards. So that's been the nice thing about this this seminar series. We've seen some people doing some really really cool things. Um, so yeah, this is a uh, you know this is a, a geotiff um, with a digitized version of uh, Pemberton of the Pemberton and Trutch base grid from uh, their 1859 um, um, cadastral uh, survey. Um, so there's all kinds of different you know layers and layers in here, but those are completely uh, user generated. Now, I've got lots of different choices for actually viewing the rest of my data. I can just turn it on by project, um, um, by type, whether it's interview data or mobile data or survey data or referrals data. I can also turn on shared projects here that I might have received from someone else. Um, and I can also just overlay by the specific codes. So if I wanted to do, say, just see, um, uh, one particular, uh, let's say, hotels and roadhouses um, or industry. Uh, so basically, you can turn things on by by individual category as well, or sorry, individual code. Uh, you can also uh, just query them uh, by geofence. So if I were to go in here and search this area, okay. So here's the thing: we built this thing called a reverse geoparsing engine. So I'm going to I'm going to search this they're going to geofence this area. Trillmark is going to gather the coordinates and send them up to the cloud. And now the results come back and tells me what place names are associated with those coordinates. So these place names are not actually on the map. Like if you look and find Camry Point, you won't find that on this on this map. It is only in the database. The nice thing about this database is that it could be user defined. So you can put indigenous place names in it. You could put the names of people who are associated with places. You could even put events that are associated with places. Now, if I in this, so what it's offering to do is to search the archive material against those the names of those places. And then it's also said to me, in addition to those place names in this area, we've also got data inside the database from from these projects, from these interview and map projects, and also from this from these mobile projects. And then, if you were to if you were to submit that, you would eventually get a get a report. This is the moment where every software developer just like holds their breath, right? <laughs> All these people on the phone. Is this where it's going to choke? Yeah. So there's a lot of data here for me to um, uh, to uh, parse through. Basically, in the in the results panel here, I've got data that's associated with the trans with transcripts. Um, I've got uh, a bunch of TUS data. 
um, some conventional kind of GIS data. Uh, just looking to see if there's anything that has a photo attached to it. I don't see one. Good choicing, good choices on my part. Oh, here's one. What's this? Am I not clicking that? I don't know what's going on there. Okay, that didn't work. Um, so with this data, you can now export the geometries. You can um, create a custom map of this, of just this map data and share it with someone by a URL or you can make a PNG of the map. Um, you can also check out what's in the archive uh, documents um, or could be artifacts or whatever um, to identify or to find uh, any what's in your archive that has those place names associated with it. So I just clicked on archive here, but it'll take a couple minutes to, to give me the um, give me the results. There we go. So these are all materials inside the archive that uh, that have those uh, that are associated with those places. Um, what we haven't done yet is is to find a way to parse those results and serve them to the user in a way that they could be used in a report. Um, once we figure out how to do that, you'd be so close to being able to do, say, uh, to be able to generate a lot of content for for a traditional use report or or any kind of you know any kind of like report that you were working on that required you to look into materials like that. Uh, you can also just search the documents and the data itself. Um, um, just like you would with Professor Google. And then finally, there's also a, a public page where you can uh, share this data on or create a, uh, create a web portal. Um, I think I pulled one of these up just so you could see. Yeah, here's one here. We feel that our web portal right now is not capable of competing with um, uh, Esri uh, with ArcGIS Online. So we're going to be um, aggressively developing this in the next couple months over the course of the next year. Um, that's a lot. There's there's a lot more uh, we could talk about, but it is four o'clock and I've, I've consumed all the time. So uh, I just wanted to... Um, you know, go back to what I was saying about about uh, SAS earlier, and say that you know, um, this is all SAS, SAS um, products are designed to sort of be able to scale upward um, nicely, and um, you know, we've we've had uh, we have quite a quite a uh, a nice user group. Now and that's uh, you know that's we've been able to to scale in that uh, in that in that direction. So um, and in you know in, in doing so that that we've overcome a, a challenge I think that that some other um, um, uh, softwares in this in this field have have had difficulty kind of overcoming. Uh, and then on the other hand, you have these much larger um, geospatial um, products that have difficulty kind of scaling down to to uh, specific consumer uh, or needs. So um, I'll stop there because it's four. Any 